Good morning. When is he going to speak? When are you speaking? Did you speak already? Have you spoken? I'm finally here. I'm speaking. I'm so happy to be here. And thank you for coming. I am so impressed that 8.30 on the third day, you guys all got up, hopefully with coffee, to come out for this. God bless all of you. And uh, it's Sunday, so I will begin with prayer, if that's okay. Okay. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the breath of life you give us, Lord, each day, and for eternal life in our Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord. And although it's, this is not a church, Lord, we are your church. We are your body of believers, Lord. So build us up. Give us our daily bread, Lord. We are all here for you to hear your word, to grow, to be built up, Lord. Convict us, strengthen us, and prepare us for the days to come until your second coming, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. All right, so if you don't know yet, my name is Ryan Peterson. Uh, this is my first year here. I'm the rookie here at the Blessed Hope Prophecy Conference uh, Forum this year, and uh, I've done my duties for two days, bringing donuts to Gary and Bob, <laughs> carrying Bill's luggage and equipment, and now I finally get a chance to speak. <laughs> they were thinking about making me sing up here, but I didn't get hazed that badly, so I guess my service the first two days was good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amen. So, okay. So, let's get started. Secrets of the pre-flood world and the days of Noah. Oh, I didn't mention I'm, I'm, I'm the author of the book, Judgment of the Nephilim. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the Nephilim, right? So in the past few years, there's books, there's videos, there's blogs about it. And, you know, there's a massive increase in interest and excitement and questions and scrutiny and some fear about it. So the first question that really we should ask is, why does the Nephilim topic even matter? What does it matter? Is this, even if this is true, it was 5,000 years ago, who cares? Well, it should matter because, first of all, it's in our Bible, right? Genesis 6 is in our Bible. If it's Scripture, and we're going to see if it is today, uh, then it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that we may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And... Of course, our Lord Jesus Christ pointed us to this time, right? Saying, as it was in the days of Noah, we know this verse well. So shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. So there was something about this time that our Lord wanted us to look to and examine and know. So it behooves us to learn it. Amen? Amen. All right. Oh, I love this crowd because I, I like call and response. I'm a church-going man, so I'm enjoying this already. So... What was taking place in the days of Noah? Um, and if you've never seen it, that's my book there. Uh, it really talks about this, right? It's really just show, the idea behind the book was to really take on this topic and show the biblical basis for a supernatural interpretation of Genesis 6. And so we're going to look today in this session at specifically what was taking place in the days of Noah that, what, that necessitated the flood. So what was taking place? So the first thing was we had open interaction in the earth between humanity and angelic beings. The invasion of the sons of God in Genesis 6, and these were apostate angels who took human women as wives. The birth of the Nephilim. And the physical and moral degradation of the human race. So this obviously... Um, you know, we want to make sure it's great to say these things, but we want to go to Scripture and examine how it happened and make sure it's so. And so that's what we're going to do now. So the first thing we're going to look at, and it's uh, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. It's what I call in my book the ultimate prophecy. And, of course, many of you know this in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Of course, this is Adam and Eve. After they've sinned, Eve sinned. She ate from the fruit and then gave it to Adam. They both sinned, and God has judged them and the serpent. And God spoke to the serpent and said, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, <clears throat> Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee 
and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this, of course, was a startling announcement. I want to, as we think about these passages, I want you to think about this from the angelic perspective. So once the devil, the adversary, heard this prophecy from God, it was really revolutionary, right? God wasn't going to punish Satan directly and strike him down. It wasn't going to be angels coming and armies to take him and attack him. It was going to be a human, a child, a male child born of a woman, of a human, the human race, seemingly inferior, made lesser than the angels, would conquer him. So this gave the devil a target, humanity, and particularly the son that would be born of the woman one day who would conquer him. So now the focus shifted to thwarting God's plan of salvation through the promised human redeemer. And so what did that mean? To target their family, Adam and Eve's family, once they could have children. And that leads to Cain and Abel, of course, the first two sons. And again, if we're thinking about this from the angelic perspective, Cain, of course, the first son of Adam and Eve, who we all know, most of us know, was a wicked son ultimately, he could have been the Messiah, right? He was the first seed of the woman that God prophesied. So for as far as the devil knew, Cain could have been his conqueror. And so what, of course, happened is that his plans into action, Cain, of course, as we know, was going to be seduced into evil, as the story goes, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. So he offered up his sacrifice, his offering to God in faith. Cain had no faith. We know from the testimony of Scripture he was of that wicked one. So he was seduced into evil, right? And notice the language already when the Bible says he was of that wicked one, almost as if he was of the family of Satan, spiritually, obviously. And, of course, we know the ultimate outcome in Genesis 4-8. Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field and Cain, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So he murdered his brother and two seeds at one time were effectively disqualified from being that conqueror who was prophesied by God in Genesis 3.15. Of course, in God's grace, Adam and Eve had Seth, who continued the godly line, their third son. But the pattern of what was going to happen in the stage was set. And, of course, Cain then was banished from Eden altogether. Right? So he was, he was driven from the presence of the Lord. And what you'll see throughout Scripture, especially in these early books of the Old Testament, is that God will repeatedly separate the wicked from his righteous believers. He, and this is what happened. This is the first instance of that happening, of moving Cain's lineage away so that his people could flourish. Right? If you think about the Israelites in Goshen during the Exodus, how they were able to have a city to themselves to grow to millions in population. This is what God does. Why? To prepare his people to, for their salvation. And so what happened was that the human population began to grow, of course. What did God instruct Adam and Eve to do? Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. So now the strategy of targeting one son, and then another son, and another son was no longer going to be effective. The human population was growing. And so what did the devil do? Well, it needed a large-scale plan to try and stop, again, the birth of this Messiah. And that is what takes us to Genesis chapter 6. And here we enter the sons of God. And so here we read, and this is, of course, the principal passage that um, we're all talking about and here to learn about in Genesis 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw that the, da saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants, Nephilim in Hebrew, in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God, the Benaiha Elohim, came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, 
men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. So notice that it was that when men began to have sons and daughters, it was the population increase. That's the testimony of Genesis 6-1. That's what instigated this invasion. And we see already the term Nephilim, if you don't know that, it's the giants. That's the Hebrew term that's in the scripture. And of course, the sons of God uh, were the perpetrators, the invaders who took human women as wives. And so much of this topic, so much of the debate on this topic centers on the question of who were the sons of God? Who were they? Were they angels or were they just men? Righteous men who happen to marry maybe unrighteous women. So we're, of course, going to examine that by letting Scripture interpret Scripture. And so as many of you may already know, I will definitely let you know that in all the uses of the term Benaha Elohim in Scripture in the Old Testament is in reference to angels. And we see that testimony primarily in the book of Job. Of course, in Job, chapter 1 and 2, I put up just chapter 2 because the same, basically the same scene repeats itself. It says that, again, there was a day when the sons of God, the Benai Ha Elohim, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So this clearly is a scene in heaven before the throne of God, and the angels are there. Satan is there. This is an angelic gathering. So... Um, the term sons of God there is referring to angels. Next passage you see here, Job 38, a well-known passage when Job is finally being, getting a response from God after all his suffering, and God is asking him and challenging him to understand, does he even fathom the magnitude of God? And of course, he says, the Lord says, where was, that, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measure thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And of course, it's the same Hebrew term. So again, by letting Scripture interpret Scripture, we can know just from the Bible that the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 were indeed angels. But that's not the end of the evidence, because we also find out from the New Testament that they lusted after human women. In Jude chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, we read, And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So what is this saying? I mean, clearly it's showing that there was a subset of rebel angels who committed this sin. I mean, it's saying it was fornication, illicit relationships, and they were punished. God punished them swiftly and immediately. And it compares them to Sodom and Gomorrah, which, by the way, of course we know that the men of Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to... Wanted to uh, sleep with the men forcibly in Lot's house, but those men also happen to be angels. You can remember that as well. So, and look how that city was judged. Further confirmation, of course, is in 2 Peter chapter 2, where we read, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And that is precisely what is taking place now as those angels remain in the abyss today under chains of darkness until the great day of judgment. And so, you know, as I've heard, you know, at home, in my church, among my friends, some family members, you know, these people say, this is really strange. You know, what are you talking about? This is bizarre. You're trying to really say that angels did this? Like, you know, where did this come from? 
And many people think that this idea is something that was just new. It was invented about 20 years ago by L.A. Marzulli. He came up with the whole thing, you know, and he's just, we're just messing with the Bible, you know. Um, but what I try to bring out in the book is, um, is uh, and I love L.A., by the way, <laughs> um, is that this is a part of Christian thought, doctrine, belief, going back to the church fathers. And I can guarantee you, you will find many, many sources that I cite going from the first century, second century, and some I will mention today and in my next presentation that show this was nothing new. This has been an idea, an understood interpretation of scripture, not just for centuries, but for millennia in the church. So I'll go to one of my favorite theologians, A.W. Pink, in Gleanings in Genesis, speaking about this very concept, what the purpose was behind this incursion by the fallen angels in Genesis 6. And he says, the reference in Jude 6 to the angels leaving their own habitation appears to point to and correspond with these sons of God, angels, coming in unto the daughters of men. Apparently by this means, Satan hoped to destroy the human race, the channel through which the woman's seed was to come by producing a race of monstrosities. How nearly he succeeded is evident from the fact that with the exception of one family, all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth, Genesis 6:12. That monstrosities were produced as the result of this unnatural union between the sons of God, angels, and the daughters of men is evident from the words of Genesis 6:4. There were giants in the earth in those days. And of course, that's from 1922, A.W. Ping writing. Okay, so that was our background kind of primer on the basis of understanding Genesis 6, and I know there might be a lot of big questions within that, and I'm going to address many of those big questions about how did it happen and different questions we might have about Genesis 6 in my next presentation at 3 o'clock. This one I'm now going to focus on something many of you may not have um, really encountered before, and that's the, the account of the angel, the fallen angel who ruled over this pre-flood world. So we have this world where angels are marrying women, they're dominating the world, the earth is full of violence, there are giants running around corrupting humanity, but there was one angel who was preeminent over them, and I'm not talking about Satan. His name is the Assyrian, and so we're going to get to that now. The rise and fall of the Assyrian. So buckle up. Okay. So the first thing I want to explain is, in order to understand this, is to understand esoteric passages, and what I call esoteric passages in Scripture. And it's really not hard to understand when I show you an example of one. And all that means is a passage that in Scripture is addressed to a specific person, a king, a prince, someone by name. But the real spiritual message is going to an angelic being. So although it might have a person's name there or a title, it's actually being addressed to a spiritual being directly. It's a message from God to that angelic being. The most popular example, of course, Isaiah 14. Many of you are familiar with this passage, of course, in Isaiah 14. How art, thou, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now this passage, of course, is addressed to the king of Babylon. But I think it's very commonly accepted, and I think many in here would agree that this is spiritually addressing Satan and his aspirations to usurp God. Amen? Amen. All right. The next passage we see this is in Ezekiel 28, again referring to Satan now in his pre-rebellious pre state. And there we read, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. And you see, I highlighted that because it's showing you, Scripture is showing you that we are talking about 
a being who goes, who's way outside of humanity, having been in the Garden of Eden. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamonds, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Again, could this, could this be a human ruler? I don't think so. And I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou was walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Now notice again, God starts by talking about the exalted aspects of this being, who is the devil, that he was perfect. He seals, seals up the sum and then chronicles the fall, that in his arrogance, that in his rebellion, in his, his obsession with his own beauty, he wanted to serve God and talks about his, his lofty status and how he's falling from it. This will be very important to remember because we're going to see the same pattern in the next passage I'm going to show you, which is not so commonly known. So let's continue in Ezekiel 28. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities. By the iniquity of thy traffic, therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. So it closes by saying, this is what others who know you are going to think of you. They're going to see your fall and be stunned, astonished at it. And again, we're going to see this exact same pattern. Where? In Ezekiel chapter 31, which is a warning to this being the Assyrian, as he's called in scripture, who is this angel who was leading this rebellion of Genesis 6, of the sons of God taking human women as wives. So Ezekiel 31 and 32, as I said, are really an address to the Assyrian, who was this, post, this antediluvian ruler. And we're going to see, again, just like Isaiah 14, just like Ezekiel 28, that although the passage appears to be referring to Pharaoh of Egypt, it is truly directed to this angel, this rebel angel, who reigned over all of the sons of God, who, took, who joined in this rebellion in Genesis 6 and the Nephilim, and was ruling the world before the flood. So, going right to Ezekiel 31... We read, and it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh king of Egypt and to his multitude. Whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon, with fair branches and with a sh shadowing shroud, and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. So right here we see that God is starting the same pattern, talking about the, the great aspects about this being. And I put a picture there of a Lebanese cedar. Just for comparison, they were obviously tall trees. And it's interesting that in Amos chapter 2, the Lord speaking about the battles against Og and Sihon that the Israelites um, went to before entering the promised land that Moses led. And these were giants. These were Nephilim kings east of the Jordan at the gateway to the promised land recounting the victories that Israel was given by God over those giants. The Lord, this is God speaking, yet, I, yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was as strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruits from above and his roots from beneath. Also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you by 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. So God, again, is taking this symbolism of this Lebanese cedar to talk about angelic beings, and the Nephilim. So, we also see another passage in Isaiah 2 where God, this is an end times passage, we see here in Isaiah 2, and I won't read the whole thing, but you'll see it in verse 3 and 4, we know this verse well, he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, they shall 
beat their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. So this is talking about the millennium when Jesus has returned. This is an end times context. And as the passage continues in Isaiah 2, talking about the day of the Lord, it says, The day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan. And the repeated theme, when you look at the day of the Lord or end times passages, that God isn't going to just judge the unbelieving world. He's going to judge the rebel angels as well. And so they are repeatedly referred to as cedars of Lebanon or as trees. And if you're thinking, okay... He's calling a king a tree. He's calling a why. That makes no sense. If it still seems like a stretch, I will show you again the, what I call the Rosetta Stone to understanding this, this, this language, that, this metaphoric language that the scripture is using. And that is found in Daniel chapter 4. And of course, in this chapter, King Nebuchadnezzar, who um, was the king of Babylon, most powerful man on the earth, has this dream that he has to go, is disturbing him, he has to go to the prophet Daniel and say, help me understand it. And he says, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee. Tell me the vision of my dream that I have seen and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, of the earth and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the heights thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to, end of, to, the, to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the, in the bows thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. He cried aloud, as we continue in the passage, and said, and said thus, Hew down the tree, and this is a watcher angel speaking, and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. So he has this dream where this, obviously this massive tree is being ordered to be cut down by these watcher angels and holy ones, who decree that's going to be judged. And of course, he says, Daniel, what is the meaning of this dream? And Daniel goes through the, goes through the description, says, The tree you saw us, which grew strong, reach up to heaven, whose leaves were fair, fruit thereof much. It is thou, O king, thou art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. So I show this passage to show again that we can rely on the internal consistency of the Bible, to let Scripture interpret Scripture, to know that the tree metaphor for a king, for a powerful being, or for an angel is accurate. Now, getting back to Ezekiel 31, and what is the description of the Assyrian? We read, The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high. And I'm in verse 4. Uh, with her rivers running around his plants, and sent her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his bows were multiplied, and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. All the fowls of heaven made their nest in his bows, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. So this is talking about his preeminence, that he was the ruler of the world. Right? All great nations were under his shadow, just as Nebuchadnezzar in his day was the, basically the ruler of the known world at that time. Thus was he, the Assyrian, fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his bows, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches. Nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. Are we seeing the transition yet? The Garden of God. It's talking about Eden. Could it be? Well, let's see. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden, 
that were in the garden of God envied him. So we see this being became so great, so mighty, that all the other angels who were in the garden, who were roaming the earth at that time, were envying him. This is the testimony of Scripture. In fact, Ezekiel 31 mentions the Garden of Eden more than any other chapter in the Bible. So this is talking about the history of the world in the days of Noah. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height, and he hath shot up his top among the thick bows, and his heart is lifted up in his height. Now again, God starts by talking about his greatness, right? The same pattern we see in the other passages. Then his sin, because he's exalting himself over other angels, and now it talks about his judgment. I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. Now it's the judgment that we're talking about of this angel and his whole angelic Nephilim hybrid kingdom. So who is this mighty one of the heathen that he's being delivered to? Well, it is the devil. So we know three times in the Gospels, Jesus refers to Satan as the prince of this world. And those, vo- those verses are up there. We see, I'll just read one in John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Referring to Satan's temporary limited authority he's been granted by God to have to have rulership and wreak havoc, essentially, in the world. So why would this happen? Why would Satan do this? Well, this wouldn't be the only time in Scripture that this type of punishment happens, where someone, Satan, is the most wicked being and will destroy anyone who God will allow him to. We see that in Job, where where God permits Satan to harm Job, but not to take his life. So God sets the parameters that Satan works in, but when he's allowed to kill, he will destroy That's what he came to do, to destroy and kill, and murder from the beginning, as Christ our Lord said. But it's not the only example. So we see in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul saying the same thing in 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 18, and we read, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Again, Paul, who um, really openly calls out Christians who are apostate or defecting from the faith, all throughout his epistles, writes in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 4 and 5, and of course this is about you know, 1 Corinthians, that, that church was, you know, they had a lot of issues going on, so they had to hear, you know, they have Members of the church uh, having relations with their step-parents, essentially. And so, what does Paul say? In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one to sa- unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So this idea of delivering one to Satan is seen throughout the Old and New Testament. And this is what happened to the Assyrian to lead to his judgment. Now we continue in our verse by verse through Ezekiel 31. And strangers, the terrible of nations, have cut him off and have left him. Upon the mountains and all the valleys his branches are fallen and his bows are broken by all the rivers of the land. And all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heaven remain and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches. So what's happening here is God said his time was up. Now he's going to judge him and allow Satan to harm him, to wreck his kingdom, to attack him. And all of a sudden, all the nations, everything was great in the beginning. Everyone was under his authority. Now they turn on him. Now they're cutting him off, which means to kill. They're attacking him to destroy his kingdom. So the whole pre-flood world at this point is caught up in war. I believe a global war. And the testimonies we see from Genesis 6 is that the earth was filled with violence at this time. This is giving the greater context to what Genesis 6 is talking about. And then we go on to the purpose that God goes on to state the purpose of this, this extreme judgment against these angels. To the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick bows, neither their trees stand up in their height, all that drink water, for they are all delivered unto death, to the nether parts of the earth, in the midst of the children of men, with them that go down to the pit. 
So there's a lot to unpack there. But what the scripture is saying is that this was done to stop these illicit relationships. God was putting an end to it to say, no longer are we going to do these things. If you notice, just think about the punishment, right? Satan is still roaming this earth seeking whom he may devour, correct? Right. But these angels were punished immediately and swiftly, taken to the abyss, dragged down to hell alive, where they remain today until the day of the Lord, until the great tribulation. And again, just to show you the history behind this, a great book, one that I reference often in Judgment of the Nephilim, written by John Fleming in the 19th century, Fallen Angels and the Heroes of Mythology, which really deals with Genesis 6. And it was the first book that really talked about the whole debate. He goes back and forth explaining both sides of the debate about Genesis 6. And he writes, an insuperable objection appears to lie against the notion that demon intercourse of the kind in question was carried on subsequently to the deluge. So what he's saying is that there's really a strong objection to the idea that angels ever did this again after the flood. I'm just translating from his old English, basically. <laughs> the purpose of God in bringing on the, on the world that widespread destruction was, we believe, not merely to punish the transgressors, but quite as much or more to put a period to the unnatural intercourse of angels with daughters of men to prevent the further commingling of different classes of creatures, to obliterate all traces of such intercourse, and to exterminate the monstrous offspring to which it had given rise. And again, you see the, the, the time there is from 1879 he wrote that. So again, you see that this is something that Christians have been dealing with and trying to interpret and understand for centuries. Now I'm going to go back to that last slide just again, because again, there was more I wanted to show that not only so we see that the punishment, and they use this metaphor of drinking water for being flooded, for being dragged into the flood, but it's also it's explaining that the Assyrian and his kingdom were going to be delivered unto death, to the nether parts of the earth, to Sheol, the abyss, right? So this is again in line with Jude in 2 Peter 2 that says that's exactly where they are today. In the midst of the children of men, with them that go down to the pit, and that's very important. We're going to see that time and time again in this chapter, the Assyrian is distinguished from humans. So we're not talking about a human king, we're talking about a fallen angel who happens to be among the children of men in the abyss, in hell, in Sheol. And we see even confirmation of this in the Psalms. Psalm 29 actually recounts this judgment against the Assyrian and the Nephilim and their kingdom. And there we read in Psalm 29, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in his beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. So they're running scared for those at home. Lebanon and Syrian, like a young unicorn, the voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. And of course, we know from Hebrews that the Lord refers to angels as ministers as flames of fire, right? So the division was that those angels who committed that specific sin were divided from the rest of the angelic realm. They could no longer participate. Even Satan is allowed to still interact and do things in the world. Those angels... No, immediate sentencing to the abyss, under chains, under darkness. You keep talking about drinking water, you're going to have to get thirsty eventually. <laughs> okay. And there are other verses that talk about this judgment, the judgment of the Nephilim and the angels who sinned. Psalm 69, listen to this verse. This is, again, showing that in ancient times, the flood devastation was so fearful. It was so terrible and terrifying that Psalmist wrote about it. Look what you see here. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. That is the exact sequence of what happened to the Assyrian, the angels who sinned. The flood waters in the days of Noah, when the flood came, overflowed them. The deep, they were then sucked into the deep, the nether parts of the earth, and locked in the pit. It was shut upon them. This is the exact sequence that the psalmist is saying, Lord, let that not happen to me. So this was known in the days of the psalmist. 
Ezekiel 26 was addressed to the city of Tyre. This is a very interesting passage as well, where it says, For thus saith the Lord God, when I shall make thee a desolate city, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep upon thee, and great water shall cover thee, when I shall bring thee down with them that descend into the pit with the people of old time, and shall set thee in the low parts of the earth, in places desolate of old, with them that go down to the pit. So again, we see all these references to even cities that may have been sucked down into the pit in the cataclysmic judgments of the flood. And so as we continue in Ezekiel 31, we're going to talk to about, again, what I love about um, this study when we go through Scripture and really try and pull together all the, the parts, that there are many different aspects of this account that you won't find in any other book, not in any apocryphal books, not in the Sumerian text, not in the Egyptian book of the dead. And this, this one, this part of this section of Ezekiel 31, really, I just think is phenomenal and amazing. And we see the biblical timing of the Assyrians' descent into hell, that the Bible actually gives you the timing of when it actually happened. When? We're going to go to the text and find out. So let's just continue. And again, we're just going right verse by verse through Ezekiel 31. Verse 15. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day when he went down to the grave, Sheol, I caused a mourning. I covered the deep for him, and I restrained the floods thereof. And the great waters were stayed, and I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all the trees of the field fainted for him. So in the day that God let the flood waters sought the Assyrian and all his Nephilim and all the angels down to the pit and to hell. What does it say? In that day, God restrained the floods. The waters were stayed, right? And we even see the testimony that the trees of the field, the angels who were left, they fainted. They were shocked when they saw this judgment. They'd never seen anything like this before. So what day was that? When were the, when were the, the flood waters restrained? Well, let's go back to Genesis and find out. Genesis chapter 8, verse 1. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained and the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the 150 days, the waters were abated. Right? When was it? 150 days, right, into the flood, that's when the waters were restrained and abated, right? That's, that's what the scripture is telling us. So, what's the significance of that? Well, again, as I've been stating, and as I believe scripture supports, those angels, those fallen angels are in the abyss. But guess what? They're going to be released. In the end times, they're going to come back. And this is a lot of what I'm researching now. I don't want to touch on it more for those who asked. We're getting close to the part where I'm going to talk about what I'm researching now and my next book. So um, they're going to be released. And we see that in Revelation 9. And look at what we read there. This is when the fifth angel sounds, the fifth trumpet. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, the pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. So already you see, the pit now is finally being opened after all these thousands of years. And what comes out of it? Smoke. Smoke so dark it blackens the sun. I believe that's the same darkness when it says they're under chains of darkness, that that's what they're under. Like the same darkness of the exodus, right? It wasn't just the absence of light. It was a thick darkness sent by God, a supernatural smoke-like darkness. And now it's being released. And now they're coming out. And the, the scripture calls them locusts. And what do we see? And it was commanded them, these beings, these fallen, grotesque, angelic beings are now being released from the abyss, that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. So these same angels, the Assyrian, all his fallen angels, the rebels with him, are punished in the floodwaters, their kingdoms destroyed, their kingdoms sucked down, all their offspring sucked down to the abyss 
of hell after 150 days of struggling in the flood. And what happens when they're released? Five months. Now we know on the Hebrew calendar, every month is 30 days. So how long do they torment the unsaved world when they're released? 150 days. You see how scripture can interpret scripture? See how it's all tied together? See how the Nephilim starts from Genesis 6? We can go back, Genesis 8, all the way to Revelation and see this is the judgment of the Nephilim, hence the name of the book. After I read this chapter and got the whole inspiration from God, thank you, Lord. So, this is how it all ties together, and they're going to come back in the end times, and we see this, the connection there from the flood to the end times, because Jesus called the end times a flood. It's not going to, the world won't be literally flooded. He said it shall come as a flood. This is the flood, an angelic flood. All right, let's continue, because it's not, Ezekiel 31 is not over yet. There's even more. But wait, there's more. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. And of course, we know this passage, and the death shall flee from them. And just look, in this passage, we, I want to move on, but just look at the description, obviously, of them, right? Of these creatures, these locusts. What are they? They're hybrids. They were like unto horses, crowns like gold. Their face was the face of men, hair as a woman, teeth as teeth of lions, breastplate, breastplates of iron, wings. They are monstrosities. They are hybrid monstrosities. They, this is a part of what happened to the angels when they sinned and that they were degraded, right? The Bible tells us that when we join ourselves unto a harlot, we become one, one with a harlot, we degrade ourselves, we defile ourselves. And in that defiling, their celestial bodies were tarnished. And I'll get much more into that at three o'clock. Moving on in Ezekiel 31. Oh, actually finishing up Revelation 9. What does it say there? They had tails like unto scorpions. See, they had all these parts put together outside of God's creation, a perversion of God's order not after their kind, as God commanded Noah to bring on the ark. And there were stings in their tails, and, they, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in, in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. So who is this Abaddon, this king? Well, I submit it was the Assyrian. And I'm going to read Job 26 from the Septuagint, which of course is the oldest extant version of the Old Testament. It was quoted by the disciples, quoted by Christ in the Gospels. And there we read, I put the translations there for giants there. It says, shall giants be born from under the water and the inhabitants thereof? Hell, Sheol is naked before him, before God. This is talking about God's preeminence. Hell is naked before him, meaning God sees everything in hell and destruction or Abaddon has no covering. So it's saying that the giants won't come back. They won't resurrect to resurrection bodies that God can see everything that's going on in hell and that even Abaddon has no covering. And I believe that being is the Assyrian in question in Ezekiel chapter 31. Continuing, I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell. Notice again, now we're getting to God describing the judgment just like in Ezekiel 28, just like Isaiah 14. Down to hell with them that descend into the pit and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water. See, the angels who sinned went with him. The trees of Eden, they shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. And that comfort, that's King James English, does not mean comfort. It means they're mourning together. They also went down into hell with him and unto them that be slain with the sword and they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. Now I'm going to show you the same passage from the Septuagint and you're going to see something very interesting there. It says, when it gets to the end, for they went down to hell with him among them slain with the sword and his seed even they that dwelt under his shadow perished in the midst of their life. Who is his seed? The Nephilim. So this is really showing the full judgment and the timing and the specific events that led to this. And again, you won't find this anywhere else but our great holy Bible, inspired by God and God breathed. Amen. To whom art thou compared? Descend and be thou debased with the trees of paradise to the depth of the earth. Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised. See, again, it's telling you the angels, it's, it's contrasting them with human beings. It's saying you're going to be with unbelieving humans. So again, we're talking about angelic beings. Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that are slain by the sword. Thus shall Pharaoh be, and the multitude of his hosts, saith the Lord God. 
So that is the end of Ezekiel 31. Ezekiel 32, interestingly, and I won't spend much time as I come to a close, but I'm like, I, I promised a preview. So if you want to know what I'm working on, this is what I'm working on. So I'll just put some verses up here. So everything you see, and, you, you know, and I encourage you, of course, to look at these scriptures, study them yourselves, and take time. You'll notice two things. Ezekiel 31, the verbs are in past tense, is looking to the past. Ezekiel 32, which is also about the Assyrian, is looking to the future. And when I shall put thee out, this is talking about a future judgment of the Assyrian. I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark. I will cover the sun with the cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. We are at a Bible prophecy conference. You better know what those signs mean, right? Amen? Are we talking about end times context here? Absolutely. I also vex the hearts of many people. So again, it's talking about the future judgment. I won't go through this. I just want to give a little hint because this is what I'm working on right now, talking about how this is going to play out in the end times. And so I'll go to another interesting passage because I love to give sneak peeks. They shall fall within the midst of them that are slain. So when the Assyrian returns and the fallen angels are released from the abyss, also in Revelation 12, we know that these angels will be cast to the earth. It says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because now the fallen angels who were in heaven, cast out by Michael and his armies are now on the earth. So again, like the days of Noah, Open interaction. The fallen angels will be here, openly interacting with humanity, just like in the days of Noah. What's going to happen when they perish, though, and they're judged? What's going to happen? Who's going to be there? Who are they going to see in hell? What does it say? And all his strength shall perish. The giants all shall self say to thee, Be thou in the depth of the pit, to whom art thou superior? Yea, go down and lie with the uncircumcised in the midst of them that are slain with the sword. And they are laid with the giants that fell of old, who went down to Hades with their weapons of war and laid their swords under their heads. So see, again, this is, again, referring back to the giants and all these angels. They're saying, we thought you were our fathers, our gods, and now you're getting judged. You're in hell like us. And notice what it says, that they had their swords with them. Now think about Korah's rebellion how they got sucked down to, earth, to hell alive, right? If you know that account. And it said Korah and their goods that appertain to them. All their stuff went with them too. It wasn't just them. Their food, their baskets, their clothes, everything went down. It was that quick. And this is what happened to the giants at the flood in the judgment of the Nephilim. So that was my little preview. You'll find out a lot more. You can ask me about it, but that's what I'm researching right now and how it all relates to the end times and the great tribulation. So what can we take from all this? We can know that the Bible has endless revelation, endless knowledge, and that this is what God wants us to know. For such a time as this, God is awakening many brothers and sisters in the faith to find these things in Scripture, and we should rejoice because the Bible has powerful revelation, and we should remember that in all that I write, all that we research about the Nephilim, this account, the main thing we should remember is that this is about God's love, God's salvation, and that Jesus Christ is the true Redeemer and the true seed. Amen? This is about God achieving his plan. No matter how far we fall into sin, no matter how much we degrade ourselves, God can pull us back time and time again and will intervene. And once we're on the brink, he steps in to punish the enemy and secure our salvation. And behold, what does Jesus say in Revelation 22? I come quickly and my reward is with me. Give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him, let him take the water of life freely. We have to remember, this can inform our witness. We need to share God's word. We are on the front lines of this war. We are on the front lines and we're the prize. So let's know the Bible, teach it. Preach it. Share it. We have a redeemer. The seed made it. He is risen. He was born. He made it. He's 100% human, 100% God, and he will redeem us. Share that word and praise the Lord. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>